Good evening, good evening to you, you. Good evening, good evening to you, you. Good evening, good evening to you, you. Good evening, good evening, won't you share with a friend or two? Good evening, good evening to you, you. Good evening, good evening to you, you. Good evening, good evening to you. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shantae Charles. I hope that you have been having a great and wonderful day. And as you know, it is Black History 365 all day, every single weekday over on this channel, this podcast, and this page. So we're taking some time this month in particular to read about some Black icons, Black history makers, Black inventors. Um, And some of them you may know and some of them you may not know, but hopefully you are learning something new that maybe you didn't know about someone that might be familiar to you. Um, Many people have asked me about uh, the shirt that I have on And this shirt comes from Target, their Black History Month collection. It also has lettering on the back. So on the front, it says Sojourner. On the back, it says Truth. Garrett, on the back, it says Morgan. Phyllis, on the back, it says Wheatley. Frederick, on the back, it says Douglas. And Edmonia, one of my favorite artists. Uh, And on the back, it says her last name, Lewis. And we talked earlier this week about making sure that you get the first printing run of the Edmonia Lewis postage stamps that are out for the very first time. So tonight we're going to jump right in and we are this time going to start with the book, A Black Woman Did That, 43 Boundary Breaking, Bar Raising, World Changing Women. And let's see who we have on the agenda for tonight. On the agenda for tonight, we have someone whose husband is well known, um, but I don't think she's as well known as her husband. And her name is Alice Coltrane. Now, if you are a jazz aficionado, you know about uh, John Coltrane. My husband loves John Coltrane. But tonight we're talking about Alice Good evening to those of you who are live and to those of you who will catch the replay either by YouTube, IG, or podcast. So let's jump right into our reading. Alice McLeod was playing the organ at Detroit's Mount Olive Baptist Church by the time she was nine years old. Later, she played percussion in her high school band. And sometimes she went along with her older half-brother, Ernest Farrow, a saxophonist and bassist. When he hung out with musicians like saxophonist Joe Henderson and the bassist Cecil McBee, whose stars were on the rise. As a young woman in Detroit, Alice formed her own band before traveling to Paris to study with jazz pianist Bud Powell. Over the decades, her deep interest in gospel, classical, and jazz gave her a strong musical foundation one that allowed her to create a sound and style of playing of her own. Early in her career, the scene was dominated by men who often doubted a woman's ability to play at or above their level. But all all it took to end that doubt was to hear Alice play. She quickly earned the respect of other musicians who often jumped at the opportunity to perform with her. The greats in music came to love her, but none more than superstar composer and saxophonist John Coltrane. 
Alice first heard John's music on the 1961 album, Africa Brass. Before I even met him and became part of the group and part of his life, she said, there was something in me that knew that there is a spiritual musical connection, a divine connection with this person. They first met when Alice was with a group led by vibraphonist Terry Gibbs. The group played a double bill with the John Coltrane Quartet at Birdland in New York City in the summer of 1963. John was impressed with Alice right away. Soon, she replaced pianist McCoy Tyner in his band. In 1965, Alice and John were married. The couple had three sons, John Jr., Ravi, and Oren, who were still small children when John developed the illness that took his life. The year was 1967, and the world mourned with Alice. But it was she and her children who had to face life without John. Alice found comfort in spirituality and music. Her first solo album, A Monastic Trio, with a sound that evoked gospel jazz, new age, Indian and African music, came out a year later. As time went on, her approach to jazz became more experimental and more spiritual. Interested in Eastern religious traditions, she released Pata, the El Daud. Ta is the Egyptian god of creation, artists, and craftspeople, in 1970. Shortly after recording her next album, Journey in, uh, let's see, I cannot pronounce this, so I'm not going to try to, <laughs> um, but it's a uh, Indian word. It says she made a pilgrimage to India. Hare Krishna and Sita Ram, two of the songs on her 1971 album, Universal Consciousness, are based on traditional Hindu chants she learned there. By the time she passed away in 2007, Alice had recorded 20 albums as a band leader and made even more in collaboration with others. She played the harp on McCoy Tyner's album Extensions and collaborated with respected saxophonist Joe Henderson on his album The Element playing the harp, piano, and other instruments. Alice processed her grief with her artistry and committed herself to a spiritual practice of self-realization. She elevated the musical traditions of her African-American upbringing, embraced world music and culture, and became one of the finest artists of her time. Born Alice McLeod, she became Alice Coltrane when she married jazz legend John Coltrane. After spending some time in India, she chose a Sanskrit name as part of her Hindu practice. She picked the name Turiya, which she translated in English as the Transcendental Lord's Highest Song of Bliss. Ladies and gentlemen, Alice Coltrane. All right. Moving on to the Fierce 44, Black Americans Who Shook Up the World. Tonight we have three in our selection. We have the uh, unforgettable Maya Angelou. And from there, we're going over to the unforgettable Mary McLeod Bethune. And from there, we're going over to Benjamin O. Davis Sr. All right. So why is Maya included in the Fierce 44? Because she rose to greatness despite cruel hardships. Maya Angelou, writer activist from 1928 to 2014. Maya Angelou lived a life just as remarkable as the poetry and prose she, she crafted. She experienced a traumatic childhood marked by sexual abuse and violence and at one point stopped speaking for five years. During this time, she memorized poetry, rearranging cadences and reciting Shakespearean sonnets in her head. With the help of a teacher, Angelo was able to speak again. She used literature to help her recover from trauma, but she got pregnant at 16. She found work as San Francisco's first African-American female cable car conductor and took many different jobs to support her family. Later, she joined the Harlem Writers Guild and, with help from fellow author James Baldwin, went on to write, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, the first in what would become 
a seven volume best-selling autobiographical series. Nearly a decade later, Angelo finished And Still I Rise, a poetry collection that remains one of her most important works. Her writing earned her many awards, including three Grammys and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Angelo was also a fear, fearless civil rights activist, serving as a coordinator for Martin Luther King Jr. Southern Christian Leadership Conference and working with Malcolm X to establish the Organization of Afro-American Unity. Life tried hard to break Angelo, but in the face of it all, she rose. I would encourage you to um, check out some more work on Maya Angelou. One of my favorites uh, from her is reading. It's called A Letter to My Daughters. Very, very, very powerful um, lessons that she has in there for women. And she's really speaking from a matronly perspective about her life and her experiences and what she learned from it. Our second reading out of this book is Mary McLeod Bethune. Mary McLeod Bethune is special to me because it was the first time that I realized that um, I really enjoyed drawing. So I started drawing, I would probably say around kindergarten, but I was really drawing more like stick figures. And then all of a sudden, my artistic talent after the passing of my grandfather, um, I was around nine years old at the time. It was almost like after his passing, all of these gifts began to unlock in my life when I was nine years old. Um, I started singing when I was nine years old um, and I started uh, drawing, really drawing around this time. And I remember being in class um, in elementary school, and I remember us having to pick someone to do a project on, and I picked Mary McLeod Bethune to, to do my project. And I remember drawing Mary McLeod Bethune. I don't know what happened to that drawing. I don't know if my school just kept it, but I drew her so accurately that they actually... Um, kind of called my mom in and basically said, hey, your child has a gift and we want to um, test her to, you know, see if we can put her in an arts pro in the arts program. And so I didn't really know what was going on. <laughs> um, I just remember like I was in the third grade getting ready to go into fourth grade and they had me to go to an art audition. And, you know, they sat me down, they gave me a pencil and eraser and they put these different objects in front of me and they were like, we want you to draw these things. So I drew them. And the next thing I know, I was in a magnet arts program. And that's how I began my journey to a lifetime of visual arts and artistry. Um, and so it was a teacher that recognized that I had more than just an average ability when it came to visual arts. And also having teachers that recognized that ability and cultivated it and encouraged it um, was very, very important. So it to me, it all leads back to Mary McLeod Bethune for my life. So why is she included in here? It says, because she left us a legacy of love, hope, and dignity. Mary McLeod Bethune, 1875 to 1955, civil rights activist and educator. Though she was able-bodied, Mary McLeod Bethune carried a cane because she said it gave her swank or today we would call it swag. An educator, civil rights leader, and advisor to four U.S. presidents, the first lady of the struggle has been synonymous with black uplift since the early 20th century. She turned her faith, her passion for racial progress, and her organizational and fundraising savvy into the enduring legacies of Bethune-Cookman University and the National Council of Negro Women. Bethune, the 15th of 17 children, 
her, her parents, formerly enslaved, grew up in rural South Carolina and started working in the fields as a young girl. She hoped to become a missionary in Africa after attending seminaries in North Carolina and Illinois, but was told black missionaries were unwelcome. So she turned to educating her people at home, founding the Daytona Liter Literary and Industrial Training School for Negro Girls in 1904 with $1.50 and a handful of students. The school later merged with Cookman Institute, a school for African-American boys. Bethune served as president, one of the few female college presidents at the time in the nation, and also became president of the National Association of Colored Women. A decade later, Bethune founded the influential National Council of Negro Women. Bethune helped organize black advisors to serve on the Federal Council of Negro Affairs, the storied black cabinet under President Franklin D. Roosevelt. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt considered Bethune one of her closest friends. Bethune worked to end poll taxes and lynching. She organized protests against businesses that refused to hire African-Americans. Her entire life, she organized, she wrote, she lectured, and she inspired. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary McLeod Bethune. And it's very interesting because <laughs> we still have people that think that black missionaries are not welcome. But that didn't stop her, did it? No. It encouraged her to just take a different route, but still keep her purpose alive. Finally, from this book, we have Benjamin O. Davis, Sr., U.S. Army General, 1880 to 1970. Why is Benjamin included? Because he led the fight against enemies, both foreign and domestic. Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr. began his military career in the Spanish-American War as a volunteer in the infantry. It is thought he may have even lied about his age so he could enlist without his parents' permission. He liked the discipline and order, so a few months after he was discharged, he re-enlisted and stayed in the military for the rest of his career. Four decades later, as the United States prepared to enter World War II, Davis became the first African-American general in the army. America's military was segregated for most of his career and black soldiers had limited options for promotion. His duty assignments were designed to avoid putting him in command of white troops or officers. And to this day, we still have people that don't think that black people can be in command of white people. Wow, go figure. Davis led troops in Liberia and the Philippines, where he served with the famed All Black Buffalo Soldiers. He was assigned as a professor of military science and tactics at both Wilberforce University in Ohio and Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He rose slowly through the ranks, becoming the first Black colonel in the Army in 1930. In 1940, Davis was promoted to Brigadier General by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. During World War II, Davis headed a special unit charged with safeguarding the status and morale of black soldiers in the army. He served in Europe as a special advisor on race relations. Davis retired in 1948 after 50 years of service in the military. Six days later, President Harry S. Truman ordered the end of discriminatory practices in the armed forces. Davis's determined and dis disciplined rise in the army paved the way for black men and women, including his son, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., who in 1954 became the second African-American general in the U.S. military and the first in the Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, Benjamin O. Davis Sr., our first African-American U.S. Army general. And finally, our last reading for tonight is coming from What Color Is My World? The Lost History of African-American Inventors by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Tonight we are looking at James E. West. Every voice deserves 
to be heard. Always a fixer. James Edward West was born in Farmville, Virginia. I know exactly where that is. I've been there. On February 10th, 1931. So he's actually coming up on a birthday soon. Even as a young child, James loved to tinker. When he was eight years old, he tried to repair a broken radio. After fixing the radio, he stood on the brass footboard of his bed so he could plug the radio into the ceiling outlet. When he shoved the plug into the socket, 120 volts of electricity burst through his body. Luckily, his brother saw what was happening and shoved him to the floor, breaking the current and saving James's life. That experience inspired James to explore the science of electricity even more. Learning was not easy for James because he suffered from dyslexia. And I would actually change that sentence um, it's not a suffering, but it's a neurodiversity. Uh, dyslexia is a learning difference that makes reading difficult. James memorized his textbooks in order to hide his problem from his teachers and friends. His dyslexia did not prevent him from earning top grades and being accepted by one of the best schools in the country at the time, Temple University, in 1953. When he told his parents he was going to major in physics, they tried to talk him out of it. The only professional jobs open to a black man in the South then were teacher, preacher, doctor, or lawyer. Recall James, my father introduced me to three black men who had earned doctorates in chemistry and physics. The best jobs they could find were at the post office. My father said I was taking the long road toward working at the post office giving people a voice. While attending Temple University, Wes worked as a summer intern at Bell Laboratories, a major telephone company. When he graduated from Temple in 1957, Bell hired him on full-time as, as an acoustical scientist. At that time, the microphones that were used in telephones were so expensive and required a large battery. So Bell assigned West and German-born physicist Gerhard Sessler to team up and create a compact microphone that was highly sensitive yet relatively inexpensive. In 1964, their collaboration resulted in patent number 3,118,022 for an electroacoustic transducer, also called a foil electric microphone which revolutionized the microphone and communication industries. The technology was even used on racetracks where West advances allowed drivers to mm. communicate despite a lot of background noise. West remained working at Bell Labs for 40 years, amassing 200 patents. In 2001, he accepted a position as research professor at Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University, which means he is now in my backyard. A father figure to many. James West has a wife and daughter, but his family is much bigger than that. At Bell Labs, West was a founding member of the Association of Black Laboratories Employees, which encouraged management to fund, fund programs that helped more than 500 non-white students earn degrees in science, engineering, and mathematics. The world has responded to West's dedication by honoring him many times over. Among his achievements, in 1995, New Jersey declared him Inventor of the Year. In 1999, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And in 2006, President George W. Bush awarded him the National Medal of Technology. As for what the future holds for Dr. James West, his mind is too active to slow down. My hobby is my work, he says. I have the best of both worlds because I love what I do. Do I ever get tired of it? Not so far. So think about this, microphones and race car drivers. What do microphones have to do with being a successful race car driver? During a Formula One race, a car can reach speeds of 225 miles per hour. Because the speed is so dangerous, the driver must stay in continuous contact with his or her pit crews and team managers to know when to come in for maintenance and what to be aware of on the track ahead. 
The problem is that the noise level inside the car is extremely loud. The noise inside the race car is about the same as a 747 jet if you're just 300 feet away, explained Dr. James E. West. That lies just under the threshold of pain. Drivers would have to wait to talk until they were forced to slow down for difficult corners. Because driving through those corners takes so much concentration, it wasn't the best time to try to hold a serious conversation. But Dr. West and his team were able to cut the background noise in half by using several microphones, microprocessors to track sound, and software that filters background sounds. Now, drivers can focus on pushing their cars to even greater speeds without sacrificing their own safety. And so again, for all of those wonderful racists out there who love NASCAR, your drivers are being kept safe because of a black man. All right. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you. If you're listening by, to our podcast, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Um, and if you would like to come on, if you're on IG, if you'd like to come on and add in your part of this discussion tonight and uh, give a response to any of the readings we've had, please feel free to click the camera and I will bring you on. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues, and I've been your host tonight, Shante Charles. I want to thank you, the podcast listener, for your time and attention. Until next week, stay cool, stay good, stay black, stay human, stay kind. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so what we've learned tonight <laughs> <laughs> is that if it wasn't for black people, Bell would have been nobody. Alexander Graham Bell? Yep. That whole industry? Yep, that whole industry. That whole industry. Mm, 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 and then mm, mm, to find out what black folks did with the, with the uh, uh, speakers and microphones and stuff like that and for NASCAR, uh, you know, I mean, but then again, but then again, that goes back to what what game? <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Davis. I believe so. Benjamin O. Davis <laughs> Jr. probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think he I think he was. And uh, you know, all of that stuff, but yet we we've never done anything for this country. Yeah, only, it's a, it's country. amazing. It's amazing how some statements can come out and be so very ignorant. And it's like all you uh -huh. have to do is like read a book. That's all. And know how much has been done through the inventions and the mind of the black American. Now, here's the other amazing part about all of this. This is the mind after enslavement. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what would have been coming out of the mind of black people had they never been enslaved mm -hmm. in this country? <laughs> I'm just like this is this is the mind of a black person after centuries even during that point centuries of being pressed down mm -hmm. and being refused and being suppressed and being um kept in the dark right about English language for a period of time Mm -hmm. Not that they didn't know how to read or they didn't, didn't know languages, but the English language. And this is in spite of all of that suppression and withholding. It's like, you know, I think about a slingshot, right? It's like 
you we are that little pebble in the slingshot that you pull back and kept pulling 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 back. But when the release came, uh-huh. It just shot us into the future because they were literally creating a future uh-huh. for things that were to come. All of these inventions really, to me, are about creating something that's going to even help the future that they were not even yet in. Right. And I don't, and I don't know if people really are comprehending the prophetic level of that that it takes to put something into play that hundreds of years later is still being improved upon to improve the quality of life of people that you would never live to see. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then you have the nerve to fix your lips to say, what have we brought to the country? What? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like, do you do you understand how ridiculous you sound? They, they don't. They don't. And, and you touched on that. I mean, you, you came straight because the problem is, like you said, all they have to do is read. But this is the problem. They don't read. They just listen to the lies yeah. and take it as truth. See, just take it as truth. So, you know, or if they read, they read the whitewashed lies. Yeah. And again, I, I forget who it was. I think it was Chinua Akibe. I could be wrong. But he talked about one of the African philosophers talked about how depending on who's who's telling the story, right, it's always going to paint them in a positive light. Mm-hmm. Listen, I uh, I broke down the per- perennial gland uh, to a guy that uh, yesterday, I think it was, or uh, might have been there earlier today. And uh, he came back with a smart remark, right? That, oh, so that explains your problems, right? I said, but yet I'm much better than you. You know, I'm, mu- I'm much better, much smarter, more intelligent, more talented than you are. Mm-mm-mm. So yeah. you know, and this is the thing: they really show. This is not all white folks. Now. They really show their ignorance, and they can't even recognize an intelligent black person because we're all dumb and stupid to them. They can't even recognize an intelligent black person when they're dealing with them and not understand. Don't mess with him, because he can come back. And you can you can never reach where they can come back with. See, so they, they don't get that until they're in it, and then they go to their, their, their great comeback. They either call you a moron. <laughs> See, that's what that's when you know you got them. They call you a moron or an idiot. That's when you know you got them because they can't. They got nowhere else to go. Yeah. And I sh- and I shared that with some white folks. And some of them came back angry. Other of them said, "You know what? You're right." <laughs> I'm just gonna show you. I'm just. I'm just gonna put it up on the screen. What was what they were making five thousand years ago? I'm gonna show you what they were making five thousand years ago. This is what they were making five thousand years ago. Uh huh. Okay. I call that a huge pile of Jenga. You know, the wood, the game with the little wooden blocks. Uh huh. Okay, now let's go to (laughs) Egypt. (laughs) All right. This is a rendering of what Egypt looked like. Same time period, 5,000 years ago, okay? Uh Uh So, come on, people. Let's think about that. Let's think about that. 
I'm, I'm going to show it. I'm going to show it to you again. We were building this five thousand years ago. Uh huh. All right. In that same time period, they were building this. Uh huh. Okay. So you tell me who is the more underdeveloped. And, and not to mention that numbers and alphabet, that's us. Oh, yeah. Cuneiform, the Sumerians. Yeah, that's us. Yes, mm -hmm. that's us. So what did you all contribute? Yeah, and let's... I let's, mean, that's the question. Let's talk about these people here. Uh, these people were before the Greeks. These people are called these people are called the Minoans. I'm going to show you them. Let me see. I'm trying to get an image that's not whitewashed. <laughs> ah, here we go. Okay, these these are the Minoans. Mm -hmm. These are not white people. <laughs> now, they said that the Minoan supposedly had long, curly hair. I think this is their interpretation of, of locks. Uh-huh. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah. These people were so awesome that they rode bulls and they rode dolphins. Uh -huh. And they were invaded by the Greeks who hijacked their ideas for the labyrinth or the maze that we know now. Here's, here's another Minoan. They were known as great seafaring people. Okay. So the Minoans were an African origin people. Some people say they were of Persian origin. Um, but again, the Greeks came in, hijacked things they were doing in their culture, and a lot of historians say that they were um, blended into the culture or they melded into the culture. So we continue to just see or have this history of seeing, you know, where things that we've done get absorbed into these other cultures. And at some point, you begin to start to understand why sometimes people say, no, we would rather be over here doing our thing so that we can maintain our culture or we can hold on to the things that belong to our culture. Yeah. So it, it, it does... You do start to see why certain why some people feel that way. Because it's like, okay, I might want to befriend you, right? I want I might want to be a neighbor with you, but I don't necessarily want you to swallow up everything about my culture and the things that my culture has built and created. I don't want that to just be erased in the name of integrating if that makes sense mm -hmm. right right well nobody else has done it oh they're definitely not doing it <laughs> right so you know i mean but when we don't do it then it's a problem yeah see so you know uh problem is is that they're they're bi bipolar <laughs> see that, that's what i'm beginning to, to really think that they, they are bipolar it's like they keep switching out. Yeah. See, yeah, it, be, it becomes, it becomes you're oh, inferior and we want nothing to do with you. And then come let us, come let us join together. Mm -hmm. So you have, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, we got a group of problem people. They, they, they really got problems. They really got issues. And it's like they look at everybody else and, and point to everybody else that's got issues. No, you all got issues. 
you all need to make up your minds whether whether the Jews were white or not. Mm -hmm. See, because now because you made Jesus white, you made God white, so his people had to be white. You're saying that you're God's people, but then we got those white Jews over there that when Ruby says it, it wasn't a race problem because they were white. The Ashkenazis were white because they were white. Now you got a problem with her. You got an issue with her. For yeah. speaking the truth. Yeah, and I think what she was, because I went back and listened to it, what she was actually saying was there's a difference between ethnicity and race, and there is. Exactly, exactly, and there is. There is. But I think, it, I think it's more telling, like someone said, I think it's more telling of where we are headed with the culture in terms of not only do people not you they want you to be kind right they want you to be compassionate but at this point people don't even want you to have your own point of view about things exactly like she never she didn't say anything like i hate them they're bad they're evil they're devils none of that stuff because when people said anti-semitism i was like okay well let me go and see what it is that she actually said and anybody in like she, in like she said she was actually quoting a jewish writer it wasn't even her own thought right she was quoting someone else and she got the suspension but again i have a whole philosophy about that and i'm just like listen there are certain things that they can say and nothing happens like joe rogan and then there are certain things that we can say. We can say the exact same thing they just said, uh -huh. and all of a sudden, we are we are the enemy. That's how you know that this country is still ruled unequally, uh -huh. and that anything we say can be demonized. Uh -huh. That's where we are in this country. And I was sharing with someone the other day because they were talking about um, the cancel culture thing. And I said, if you notice, a lot of the um, a lot of the so-called liberal commentators are being either suspended, fired, removed to make way again for more conservative anti-black commentators that's really what they're doing and when you see that happening you know that we're about to again in leadership see this whole anti-black leadership coming back again because they did the same thing right as obama was ending they started letting go all of the black people and all of the commentators that were for some kind of you know moderation in thinking and they started bringing on slowly all these conservative commentators and then we had a whole four years of alternative facts from the news on down everybody had alternative facts going on so when i see that again when i start seeing them turning over all these people that's supposed to be have reason that lets me know what's coming down the pipeline that we're about to see it again we are about to see it again and people are going to be irate <laughs> but that's Listen, but that's where we are I, I actually had to break down the term woke again and i said and i asked myself what's the opposite of woke sleep or comatose right now, which would you prefer to be? You only got you only got one of those three choices. Which would you prefer to be? Rope, sleep, or comatose? When you sleep or comatose, people can come in and break in your face and steal everything. And, and all, you know, depending on how heavy of a sleeper you are, but when you woke, you hear them coming. Yeah. And you see them coming. It is. So which would you prefer to be? It is where this country is headed. We're headed back into another regressive time of thought mm -hmm. and they're showing you better than they can tell you and i'm just like i need us to 
see the signs and take notice. I'm going to be honest with you. If I had children right now, I would actually be trying to figure out how I'm going to be leaving the United States in the next two to three years. Uh -huh. If not sooner. Because the condition of this country, especially when it comes to black children, uh -huh. is worsening. Listen, and got, if you can't, if you can't afford to educate your child, I'm just being honest. If you can't afford to educate your child or make sure that they have some sort of additional education besides the one that they're getting right now. It's about to be a whole heap of mess with all of these laws that are being passed, which is basically saying that teachers can't be honest. Teachers can't teach the truth about the history. Teachers, teachers can't make children what well, this they're saying make them feel guilty. But I'm like, if you're telling the truth about what their ancestors have done, obviously it's going to upset them. And so when you have states passing laws saying you can't teach a curriculum that's going to upset the feelings of people, then you stop, you stop teaching. Uh -huh. You've now moved into propaganda. Propaganda is we are great and there is no other narrative to be had. That's propaganda. And so, and so, yeah, you are seeing and you are going to see teachers leave the profession to either go work independently or to go work um, in private education. But you're going to see it because if you are a true educator, you're not going to want to be in a space that forces you to compromise teaching the truth. Right. Because you're an educator. Right. And that's what you want to do. Open people's eyes to the truth. Yeah. So, like, to tell an educator that, that's literally like a soul death mm -hmm. for teachers. You're that's saying, collector, that's different. you're saying, I can't do what I was created to do. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. And so, yeah, there are people that are, they're leaving. They are leaving. And it has nothing to do, it's not that they don't love children. It's, it's not even so much even the, the level of paperwork or anything. It is the whole doctrine of education is on trial. The whole method of why and what we do is on trial. Uh -huh. Because as an educator, if the parent or if people who are outside of my classroom are doing all the controlling in my classroom, then that means they need to be in their teaching. Exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. It's like, am I the teacher or are you the teacher? Which one are which one is it gonna be? But, but listen, that's what you're getting paid to do. <laughs> But they want to control what you're getting paid to do. And again, this is not this is not about saying your materials have to be evaluated. We know that part. But when you have people coming in saying this is history, this is what happened, and we don't want our children to hear about it because it may hurt their feelings. That's a whole different thing. That's propaganda. Mm -hmm. And we know that material has to be age level appropriate. So, yeah, there are certain things that your child is going to learn in the second grade that they would that they obviously are not going to learn in the eighth grade and vice versa. Someone was asked a question <laughs> on Facebook. They posed a question. Where's the right time to start teaching CRT, right? I said the exact same time that they start teaching racism. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing. CRT is a theory. It's a mm -hmm. legal theory and it has never been taught in a, in a um, undergraduate or K through 12 setting. What they're right. doing is they're taking things that have been taught in K through 12 and putting the label CRT on it. Uh -huh. 
So black history, uh -huh. they're putting the label CRT on it. History about the Holocaust, they're putting the label CRT on it. Uh -huh. Social emotional learning, teaching your child how to manage their emotions, they have put CRT on that. Uh -huh. They gave them a bad name and they're labeling everything now. That, that, right. That's what they do. Exactly. That's what they do. So they've relabeled everything that is normal education as CRT so that it can be removed. <laughs> Uh -huh. That's what's happening. If you just want the shorthand of it, that's what's happening. So this has been another episode of Daring Dialogues. And I've been your host tonight, Shante Charles. Thank you for co-hosting tonight, Pastor Ben. I want to thank you all for your time and attention. Remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. I will continue to share out the truth on all the platforms I can possibly share it on. And I will continue to do it until somebody pulls my coattail. <laughs> and even when they pull my coattail, I'll be over on my own website, robertandshanteglobal.com. So you can always reach me there uh, if you want to contact me about tonight's show or you want to contact me about coming to speak at an event on this subject. You can contact me through my site. So. Be brave, be bold, courageous, and most importantly, be what, Pastor Ben? Light. Be light. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and God bless.